today I want to tell you about an art project that I undertook at IUSB with my sculpture professor, Tuck Langland. I studied with him for seven years while getting my master's degree. He's a wonderful teacher. He asked, what do you want to do? And when I said I wanted to make a goddess, he said, go for it. Find out what you want to make, and I'll show you the techniques. So I began a long study of the female form, and I fell in love with this little piece known as the Venus of Willendorf. She has garnered as much controversy as Miley Cyrus. Archaeologists and curious people like me have tried to pin her down and define her. Her true origins are lost in a Paleolithic time fog. I googled the Venus and found thousands of stories, conjectures, and pictures of her. So who was she? Who was the artist that created her? How did she survive for 29,000 years since the Ice Age in Austria? First of all, it was intriguing to me to see that art was being created so long ago. She was found in 1908 by roadside workers near the Danube River. She was made in one simple lozenge shape with round breasts and belly. Her body showed traces of red ochre, a color associated with a woman's menses blood. She, she now resides in a Vienna museum near Willendorf, Austria. The first book that I read on my search was When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone. This book opened my eyes to the history of goddess lore. It fascinated me. It was full of speculations about the origins of the little Willendorf goddess. These are illustrations that aided my research. We are just beginning to uncover the secrets of the past with x-ray scanners and new technologies. So my sense of things is this. The Venus of Willendorf was a well-fed female who was elevated in the tribe because she was a creature that had a special kind of magic. She was a goddess who held the secret of life. She was able to give birth. They thought that the baby came out when the menses blood was withheld for a time. And from her breast came life-giving milk. It has been said that when a woman wanted a child, she would go outside and expose her belly to the full moon. Therefore, she was treated with respect. She was a special kind of human. A goddess, perhaps, whatever that meant. We can presume that people revered women because we find archaeological evidence from sites widely scattered across Neolithic Europe and around the world, mainly small female figures with large breasts. Did they see the females as goddesses? Why did every tribe on earth contrive a female art object? Very few male objects were found. But when did men find out what was causing it? When did they realize, somewhere in time, that the magic of pre producing a child required two people? This began the battle of the sexes. Who's boss? The battle of patrilineal versus matrilineal inheritance. Isn't it interesting today most cultures still admire women with big beautiful breasts? I believe that primitive people were born with innate intelligence. Just as we know now that babies are born with their full potential already present. We have evidence that women learn to cultivate grains, tend the fires, and make hardened clay vessels. Surely they did more than pick berries for supper. They had to protect their babies and keep their cave livable. 
They created a peace-loving agrarian civilization where around 10,000 before Christ, women, in, I should say, uh, women invented tools, agriculture, medicine, ceramics, textiles, and written language. The religious ideas of early humans are richly documented in their tombs, temples, and painted pottery. The earliest graves were womb-shaped holes in the earth covered with red ochre, which is, symbolizes menses blood. Marija Gimbutas wrote the language of the goddess. She's an archaeologist who presents a glossary of symbol motifs that reveal our ancient religious culture and spirituality. She gives evidence to prove that a great mother goddess has been worshipped from the Upper Paleolithic Age approximately 25,000 years ago until the closing of the last goddess temple about 500 A.D and that her religion has been rigorously suppressed ever since. The goddess was not a simple, simple fertility cult object. She was a deity. Webster says one exalted or revered as extremely good or powerful. By 7,000 B.C. in Canaan, people were living in brick houses, with sewage systems, and women were equally involved in the government and commerce of their cities. Hesiod, 8th century B.C., Greek poet, saying of ancient Crete, the earth poured forth its fruit in bondless plenty. In peaceful ease they kept their lands and did not worship the gods of war. The mythologist Robert Graves states, the whole of Neolithic Europe, to judge from surviving artifacts, had a remarkably homogenous system of ideas based on the mother goddess. Carl Jung suggests that the archetype mother is part of the collective unconscious of all humans. Why don't we know more about this aspect of our history? Goddesses have been found from the Pyrenees to Siberia, dating from the Upper Paleolithic. From the time that men began to write the Bible, female objects uncovered by archaeologists were put down and demeaned as mere fertility fetishes. In the Old Testament of the Bible, Joshua was ordered by Yahweh to quote, You must completely destroy all the places where the nations you have conquered have their gods, on high mountains, under any spreading tree you must tear down their altars, smash their pillars, set fire to the carved images of their gods, and wipe out their name from that place. And to quote from Joshua, they destroyed everything in the city, put to the sword, every man, woman, and child, every living thing. This is from Joshua, verse 17, Deuteronomy. What was going on here? Archaeologists speculate that the reason so many figures small enough to be held in the hand were found because of the violent destruction of goddess sites. What was left were small goddesses hidden near the hearth or kitchen. The monumental sites were crushed. The godless goddess religion did not fade away. It was ruthlessly destroyed over time by conquering northern tribes, according to researcher Merlin Stone. The goddess people had no war machine to defend themselves, and when the Israelites marched into their so-called promised land, they destroyed every aspect of the peaceful culture they found there. 
This land of milk and honey is present-day Iraq and Iran, Mesopotamia, now known as the cradle of civilization. It lay between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, known as the Delta of Venus. During the Crusades, the Christians were known worldwide for their destruction of sacred icons and literature from the so-called heathen religions. It has been told they burned the great library of Alexandria, a priceless treasure of ancient wisdom. Later, the Bible seemed to have purposely uh, glossed over the fact that the dreaded pagan deity was a woman and had breasts. Everything became God instead of goddess. Finally, the archaeologists who reported on their digs were biased. They demeaned the objects they found, named them fertility objects, and carefully buried them again in dusty museums. As a result, the status of women was greatly eroded. This led to ever-increasing censure of females, especially their sexuality. The established churches were so male-oriented that women were not allowed to take part in the sacred services and were admonished to keep their silence at church. To reinforce their subordinate role, it was decreed in church law that a man is master by divine right. Fifteen centuries after the major destruction of the goddess worship, a wonderful turn of events occurred. It was the first women's rights conference at Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. Out of this came the Women's Bible by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the beginning of the women's movement. I began to realize that the goddesses that I have replicated are not fertility fetishes, but they symbolize female mystery and power in the same way that a phallus is the symbol of masculine power. And as I work with the clay to create a goddess, it becomes obvious that I am created a sensitive symbol of all women, and I am taken back 29,000 years to the original artist's act of reverence. Then I went on to extrapolate on the theme and came up with my own version. In closing, I must say that this is a difficult subject to propose to a modern audience. I feel a little intimidated expounding on 30,000 years of history. I've given you a few ideas to speculate on. And that's the true work of an artist. Thank you.